are, of course, working with our colleagues at Sky Sports News who will keep us up to date on any developments. But as we understand it, as we speak, deadlines have passed and no deal has been done. However, I'm told in both circumstances there is cautious optimism. Certainly, we all hope that something can be done. Now, Phil, there's so much to talk about with you and very uh, grateful to you for joining us. Um, probably the thing that's on my mind the most is three years at the club, 18 months of absolute turmoil. Why, in the end, did you finally go? What, what was, was there a straw that broke the camel's back? Not really. I just felt myself and, and Steve Parkin had taken things as far as we could and we'd gone through a lot, over, particularly over the last year and into pre-season this year as well. Um, we felt the takeover was just about to happen and we felt the time was right for ourselves, for our own careers going forward, but also for the club and for the new people set to buy the club to give them a fresh start as well. So we just felt the timing was right for everybody concerned and, and we took the decision and um, I spoke to the administrator about it. They were great. I spoke to Sharon Britton, who's hopefully going to be uh, the new owner of the club. She understood totally. Um, so it was very amicable and obviously, you know, I've got fingers crossed like everybody that, that the situation can be resolved. I'm sure it's a long, long list, but what was the most difficult thing? Uh, well, without doubt, the, the players and staff not getting paid. was um, It's the first time I've experienced that as in my whole career as a player or as a manager. And in any walk of life, if you're not getting paid, um, it's going to affect your motivation uh, and your ability to do your job. And uh, that went on for five months, uh, which is a long time. And quite often people will say, well, players can afford not to be paid, they're on good money. But we had players on four or five hundred pound a week at the under 23 level and some of the scholars who didn't go five months without getting paid, but you know, at times a month without the wages. Um, and that's difficult when people have got mortgages to pay, they've got rent to pay, they've got cars. Um, and that was tough and the players found it very difficult to cope with, as did the staff. You know, the staff were putting petrol in the car, driving into work, continued to take the training. Um, and it became almost impossible in the end. And, you know, you kept believing that the takeover was going to happen and it'd all be resolved. But as you know, and everybody knows, it's just dragged on and on and on. Um, so, yeah, without doubt, the, the non-payment of salaries um, is almost an impossible task to keep, keep things going. Mark, how much is there a, a fear within the game that we might see more of this? You know, you, you obviously, both you and Andy, you speak to people in football all the time, other managers, players. How much is there a genuine concern? If you speak as a football supporter, Jeff, you, you're looking at two clubs here in Bolton and Bury who are founding members of the Football League. So the history and tradition and fan base that goes with, with clubs of this stature. So if they're in this type of trouble, this turmoil, and it's been allowed to get to this stage, you have to worry that the fact there could be double, double figures of clubs. If one goes like a pack of cards, that's a, that's a concern. So for, for me, if it can happen to this level of club, what's behind it? How many more clubs can go down the same road? That has to be a genuine concern. Andy, easy question, but I suspect not an easy answer. How do we stop this happening? Well, that seems to be the question on everybody's lips. Yeah, look, I know Ken. I know Ken Anderson. Um, in fact, I recommended Phil to Ken when he first took over, took over the club, along with a couple of other managers. Um, he, was, he was asking me an opinion on people, as he was probably asking tons of, of, of others as well. Um, and knowing him, I'm just surprised he's, it's, he's hung around at Bolton for as long as he did with it and, and missed opportunities to move the club on into, I don't, into other hands. I don't think Kev, Ken ever really had plans on being the medium to long-term owner of the club and wanting to really take it forward because he didn't have the money to do that. I don't believe he had the, but, the money to do that. So I don't understand why it's dragged on, Jeff, as long as it has. I really don't, and it surprised that, me. And sorry to interrupt you, but doesn't that, in many ways, ring alarm bells? That you know somebody's looking at the club short term, as though. Like, yeah, but they needed that. Yeah. The, the club, the club at that time, the club at that time, there was a there was a problem, obviously, with Dean Oldsworth's deal. Yep. Ken's jumped in there and decided he could do it, and and I I think he had, for what I know, I think he had plans on maybe staying there for a short period and then letting someone else take it forward from there with some serious money. Now, I don't know, I haven't spoke to Ken for months, but, but, but I don't know what's gone on and, and, and how it's gone from, from, as Phil says, from one deal nearly happening to falling over and then another one nearly happening, then it goes 
and and then it's just become such a such a protracted mess. So, uh, but but in answering your question, the only way you're going to do this is when when people want to get involved in buying a club, then that. You can't just turn around and just show proof of funds like you're buying a house. Here, look, here's, an, here's a bank statement and there's some money in there. That can, it's, got, it's got to be far more stringent than that. You've got to put up some serious amount of money that can run a club for either a year, 18 months, two seasons, whatever. That's got to be like on the table to enter a period of exclusivity where you can then go and start talking about the finite points about owning, a, owning the club. And the basic question, why? So all the finance is exactly right and making sure long-term health and welfare of the club is secured. But why are you doing it? If you're going to come in here with a three or five year plan for you to take X amount of money out of the club, be honest up front with it. It's a business, everyone wants to make money. So put your plans out, but why are you coming in to buy a club? Because you impact the communities that support so many people are affected by, by what's happened today. So I, th I think the ideal scenario what you're talking about is great, Andy. And but in Bolton and Berry's case, both of those the clubs were sold right when the clubs were on the brink, like you said, when Ken bought it, when Berry was sold last time. So those kind of checks and that due diligence by the EFL probably wasn't as stringent as it should have been, and that's why this situation has happened. Now with, with Bolton, for instance, obviously the administrators had a chance to speak to a lot of potential buyers. The potential buyers have had to show a business plan to the EFL to show that they are creditable and they're ready to take the club forward. So I've no doubt at this stage, that if this deal gets over the line, it's a deal for the long term. But there is situations where people get pushed into a corner yeah. rather than a club well, going out of business. That. They've just got to let someone go yeah. in and they pick up the pieces going forward. And I think that's what's happened in, in these two scenarios. How, how different and why the difference between Berry and Bolton and the scenarios? Well, you want about starting the season. I mean, because that, you know, I've been asked that a lot, you know, uh, Bolton were able to start the season, Barry weren't. Um, first of all, I think the EFL have been in a very, very difficult position with, with this decision. But the week leading up to the season, you know, we'd managed to play two behind closed doors friendlies. We had trialists in the building who were ready to sign. We'd obviously looked at loan players we could bring in as well. The takeover was a couple of signatures away from being done going into that Wickham game. Um, the potential no owner, Sean Britton, came to the hotel on the Saturday, had a chat with the players. We got a team out on the pitch and we all thought, great, come Monday, the takeover's going to, be happen going to happen. And you were quite happy to meet with her and you made it clear, look, you know, there's good players here, we've got this, that and the other, but when you come in, I'll, I'll be going elsewhere. No, I, di I didn't say that at that moment. This was on the Saturday leading into the game where she came to meet the players in, in the hotel about explaining to the players that the takeover was very, very close to being done. Uh, but I think what happened after that was people started manoeuvring positions, etc. Thought, well, we've played the first game now, we can sit back and negotiate a little bit harder uh, with, with the deal. Um, but that's why we, we were able to start the season, is because everybody felt that the deal was ready to be done, even though at that moment we didn't have sufficient players really to go through the, the first period of games. Mm. It, it, in a strange way, was one of the, the worst things you did drawing 0 0 with Coventry? Well, I mean, that was... In, in a bizarre yeah. way. Yeah. A great effort, plucky, but... But I think that's probably another example of it, that we got that great result. There was lots of publicity from it about the young players we've got, and there are some very good young players. But equally, the people involved in the deal probably thought that's an opportunity for them to stretch out negotiations again, when really it was the time to go, bang, let's get the deal done now and let's bring some senior players in to help these youngsters. But it's just dragged on that extra couple of weeks, which obviously doesn't help in terms of recruitment and, and the, the squad going forward. And even if it was well-intentioned, do you think that was possibly an error in hindsight? A, a new owner, the deal's not done, coming to meet the manager and the players. Because then when it doesn't happen, it's another full store, another deadline gone. <clears throat> Remember Michael Knight and all those years ago? Exactly, Old Trafford. juggling the ball at Old Trafford. Juggling the ball at Old Trafford, you know, and... and, and 10 million quid, I think it was at the time. Yeah, he had an option. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, of course it is. Of course it's, it's, it's a mistake. And, and, and again, I think that, as Phil says, you know, there's that air of desperation around a club and then all of a sudden it's like, whatever deal we can get done, let's get it done and then we'll try and file down the rough edges and we'll smooth it all out and we'll get it uh, operational over a period of time. Um, the rules and the regulations that the EFL seem to have in place. I don't seem to see how the, the rules, the same rules apply for Berry as they do for Bolton, even though they're in the same league now, whatever. The, the, the size and scale of the clubs are so different 
that, that I think that, you know, they should be working under slightly different rules, to be honest with you. And, 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 and so I don't quite understand why we can, you know, we can't just throw them all in, into, the, into, the, into the same basket, throw a towel over both clubs and say you have to operate by this set of rules and this set of rules, because the size of, of Bolton compared to Bury, they're, they're completely different. Different really agendas. Different, different agendas, different incomes, different money coming in, going out. You know, Bolton, Phil, Phil's been in charge of a club that have had a Premier League, not tradition, but they've had a, they've had a, yeah, a, a very healthy period in the Premier League where, and, and so you can understand the fans, there's that huge expectancy around Bolton, whatever's been going on, fans still see themselves as a club that should be out of rub shoulders with some of the biggest and the best. Um, so, look, they, again, I, I think the EFL have got to have a serious think about the way that, that they set these guidelines for people coming in and, and picking up clubs, because otherwise it could get worse, all this. It's, it's one of the problems. Uh, I mean, the EFL is undergoing a change of leadership as well. Yeah. And I understand there is a, a, a different, if you like, mood at the EFL, and they are well aware of the problem, the devastation this causes to communities, to clubs, to supporters, uh, not least. That the EFL, because it, it, it organises a competition, there are lots of owners who don't want to restrict who they can sell to because maybe one day they'll be in trouble and they need to get out quite sharpish. So they're careful about being restrictive as to potential buyers, particularly in a, a fire sale situation. Mm. But you have to look, we're very proud, aren't we, over here in, in this country of the 92 club structure. It's, it's unique, it's unlike anything else in the world, and quite rightly, the level of support, look at the, some of the crowds in League One, etc. Sunderland getting 40 odd thousand in League One. So we are the envy of the world in terms of the structure, but if it's not financially viable, what, what's the new EFL hierarchy going to do? Because as I say, if one goes, you could see 10, 12, 15 go. Now, does that cleanse the system? We may lose that very proud 92 league structure, but right now, it's not working. How, how many clubs do we think, Mark, would be out there? not teetering on the brink, but how many clubs are, are, are ever mindful of the fact that they could quite easily fall into serious arrears and debt and be in, a, be in the sort of problems that Berry in particular have found themselves I, in? I think, Andy, far more than we'd, we'd care to admit, I would imagine we're into <coughs> double figures, and we've all seen some of, the, some of the numbers coming out recently. Clubs are in dire situations right now, and as I said, my biggest fear as a football fan is if one or two, if Bolton can go, or touch but they don't if Bolton can go what does that mean for the other clubs in the, in the same situation yeah but I, I think there's there's clubs which are in trouble if rich benefactors walk away absolutely no you know, question there's there's a lot of clubs that are surviving and owners are putting a lot of money in per month to keep clubs going and as long as they've got the money to do that's fine the problem becomes when they say look we've had enough now we've had a go again into to the premiership in the like of Aston Villa yeah. you know, before they got sold that's enough, we're walking away. And let's be fair to Villa, they were quite fortunate that that takeover happened very quickly, didn't it? Because they, they, they could have been in trouble themselves. But the problem there is, Bill, <coughs> if I uh, understand exactly what you're saying, you don't want to restrict wealthy benefactors who are genuine supporters of said club coming in and say, OK, look, look Eddie Davis at Bolton, he wrote off the, the deep end of £200 million, pounds, a genuine supporter of the football club. And clubs will always be grateful. People like that are if like part of the football fabric and they are a very different profile to other owners who see it purely as a financial investment. How do you separate the two? Yeah, no, it's, it's difficult. It is very difficult to do that and I think you've got a lot of the foreign owners who've come in and you know, they, they, they want that dream of getting their team into the Premiership and uh, commercially it's great for them in Asia and all around the world and they're prepared to have a go at it for so long. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as there's a structure put in place that if they do walk away, you know, you've got to make sure there's money in place to keep the club going forward in, in, in years to come. Yeah, I've, I must say as well, we've, got, we've had a lot of very good owners come yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. We've had a lot of very good custodians of the clubs that have come in with the best of intentions and have done things properly. I mean, look at, you know, I think, I think when I look at Leicester, you know, they've, and they've, they've been through, a, of course, a a tragedy as well in amongst it all, uh, and yet it seems to be a club that is very much together, everyone on the same, the same page, and working hard to, to make them a better club every year. Um, so we've had a lot of good people coming into football in this country for obvious reasons, because it's, it's profitable and because it can be very successful. But you saw the Leicester owners, you saw the Leicester owners coming, they understood the implications of the community. 
yeah. of working with the community, what it meant to the fan base, to Leicester as an area. And as you say, they're financially guaranteed. The club is in great shape right now. But some of the owners come in, they, they truly understand what it means to the relevant community. Do you understand that, Bolt, what it means to the whole fan base, yeah. the history and tradition of the club? I don't think certain owners do. How long was it, Phil, before you started to realise that it was going to be a, this was going to be a, like, such a tough one for you? It, it wasn't like it said in the brochure, as they say. <laughs> um, well, obviously, straight away, we were in an embargo when um, I took the job three years ago. And that took us a long time to come out of that, which straight away, you, 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 there's concerns straight away. But we managed to, to deal with that at the League One level. It's when in, you then go into the Championship, it becomes very, very difficult because you're competing against a lot, a lot of clubs with, with spending power. Um, but up to that point, um, the wages have always been paid in, in fairness. And what you said earlier, Andy, about Ken, uh, the year we stayed in the Championship was his time to sell the club. Yeah, I thought he would. And, I really thought he you would. Know, he is a successful man, and yeah. he, that was the, the moment, and there was a, a deal on the table for him to sell it and say, look, I've done my bit now, I'm off. And that deal didn't happen, and that was, that was a real blow for, for the club because he then didn't have the money to take it forward because yeah. in that subsequent period, we'd sold uh, Zach Clough, Rob Holding, Gary Medin, we'd sold players to help him fund the club as it went along. So, you know, he's probably as disappointed as anyone when the club didn't get sold in, in the summer after staying in the Championship. Mm. I mean, <laughs> Berry is, you know, is a club close to your heart as well. You had four years there. The fact that it's happening, I mean, I think they're due to meet each other next weekend, mm. weren't they? Um, mm. The fact that it's happening at these clubs, you must be aware of the devastation it causes in the community, to the long-standing fans and to the other employees, as well as the, the players. Because, again, lots of players, hopefully, they can move on. Mm. You could, if you're a player, you can sign for another club. You can, hopefully, earn a living elsewhere. You can't, as a fan, say, oh, well, uh, uh, that's, that's Berry gone. I'll, uh, no, I'll go and support Oldham now. Or mm. You can't do that. No, without doubt. I mean, I, I played for Berry you know, <clears throat> 30 years ago when I went there and I still go back there now when I take teams back there and there's a lot of the same people still working behind the scenes. You know, and they're the lifeblood of the club. Yeah. I've also got a lot of friends who are Berry fans who still go every single week to Berry. Some of them still go away from home and it is their life. They absolutely love the club. And exactly the same with, with, with Bolton fans, you know, the devastation, this bad publicity, let alone if the club goes out of business, but getting their club like pulled through the you know, bad publicity in the papers has been terrible for everyone in the town. And, you know, everybody's waiting for, for the good times to come, a bit of credibility to come back into the club of both Bolton and Bury, and both clubs can move forward. What was, what was the, um, the biggest red flag that came up for you in your time there? You, you knew things were iffy, as you just said to Andy, but, but when, what was that happened that you thought, mm, there's no way back now, this is... Um, no, I think it was just when the, the, the salary didn't get paid because previously we'd had problems in bonuses, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, but not the monthly salaries. And when that didn't come in, I think it was just prior to Christmas, initially we got a loan from the PFA and then subsequent months there was problems with the salary, obviously. That, that's, that's when really people thought there, there is serious problems here. I mean, it's critical. We're, we're coming up to payday shortly, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the payday is due um, at the end of this week, so um, that's why this deal really does need to get over the line this week. How desperate times is it for people, as you said, other than the players there, you know, the backroom staff, the, the kit man? Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, very much so. And, you know, the staff come in each day and have got to motivate the players to train, and, and they're, they're pretty low themselves. So that in itself causes problems. But not only that, the, the people working at the ground, the people, the ground staff at the, at the training ground as well, it affects everybody when you're not getting paid. Everybody is really worried about the situation. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, everybody has tried to help each other. Other clubs in, in the Northwest have tried to help out. There's been a good community spirit, uh, but ultimately you've got to pay your bills and, and you need your wages to come at the end of the month. It is a, is a bit of a wake up call, don't you think? At the moment now, you get the feeling with this, with this, with these two clubs, and, and right now you just feel this is a this is a, a moment where I think something more has to be done now. Uh, with some something more has got to be done. There's got to be tougher guidelines and, and and rules and regulations surrounding people that want to come in and pick up a football club. I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to come in personally and buying a football club 
if you buy it for the right reasons. I believe Ken bought it for the right reasons, but I don't ever believe that he really felt he could take it as far as it needed to go. I'm just amazed he didn't get out of it when he had an opportunity. Uh, but, I, but, but I do think, I do think that there are people that, that sort of genuinely scare you a little bit when you see them and you hear them being interviewed and talking about potentially buying clubs. You're thinking, hold on a minute. What's going on? You talk about the damage it does there, but what, what about the damage, Mark, is done to the integrity of the league in terms of... I mean, also, as well, it depends what happens with Bolton. They've been whopped 5-0 twice. Somebody could survive on goal difference this season who didn't play Bolton's kids. I, I agree. It's just scrubbed. It, 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 I, yeah. I think it does real damage, damage to the integrity of the competition. I think you're right, Jeff. I think I'm also concerned <laughs> about Phil's earlier comment that it got to the point where they didn't do all the due diligence checks because it was such a desperate situation. Mm. So all you're doing is putting a sticking plaster on the dam and hoping it holds, and you're delaying the inevitable almost. The problems are there. If the buyer's not the right quality with the right aims, ambitions for the club and the financial stability for the club, mm. how long again? The Bolton fans have had enough turmoil now for how many months? Mm. If the owner, I'm not saying obviously the Ventures people, I'm saying if the owner's not right for any particular club, you're just delaying it for the fans and increasing the pain and what goes on in football, you may have to let, mm. to send a message out, you may have to let, I'm not saying Bolton or Berry, but a particular club go to say we've got, to, we've got to cleanse the situation, we've got to cleanse the system. Because right now there's too many clubs who could very easily follow suit. Mm.